to the webinar Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, Exploring Linkages with the Technology Needs Assessments. My name is Leah. I'm working for the Technology Needs Assessment Project, the TNA, at UNFD2 Partnership, and I will be the moderator of today's webinar. This webinar is hosted by UNFDTU and is organized in collaboration with the government of Malawi, the government of Fiji, and NIRAS. The session will last around 1 hour 30 minutes and will include time for a Q&A session. You will be muted during the webinar, but you're welcome to write your questions through the chat box. And please remember to indicate the name of the speaker your questions is asked to. If you're not able to stay until the end of the session or if you want to access our presentations again, no worries. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available online in a few days on the TNA website. So regarding the agenda of today, I'm happy to have with me today James, Christopher, Dipitika and Andreas. Together we will explore the linkages between TNAs and the sustainable development goals and the role that technologies plays in achieving sustainable development. The Engineering Consulting Group Mihas and the governments from Malawi and from Fiji will share their perspectives on this. So before we start, I would like to inform you that we comply with the GDPR and it means that your personal data is safely processed and stored and all of your rights in relation to GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data being processed about you and at any time you can request us to remove or delete or rectify the data that you provided us. So for further information on this, you can contact Aristides and Luis and you can see their contact details here. Now, let me introduce the speakers of today's webinar. Let's start with James. James Hazelip, he works at UNFDTO Partnerships uh, since 2010, and he has overseen the implementation of TNAs in 10 countries. In his work, James focuses on understanding, designing, and implementing enabling frameworks for the dissemination of sustainable energy and climate change mitigation technologies. For that, he is using multi-criteria, economic baselines, market assessments, and outcome mapping methodologies. Our second speaker, Christopher Menda, works with Malawi's Environmental Affairs Department since 2012, and he has supported the development and implementation of various climate change initiatives in Malawi. Currently, Christopher is our TNA coordinator in Malawi. Our third speaker, Dipitika Chan, is Senior Climate Change Officer for the Fijian government, and she is country coordinator as well for the TNA project, but in Fiji. She is an environmental chemist by academic background, and she specializes in conducting greenhouse gases inventory calculations for the waste and the agriculture sectors. And finally, our last speaker, Andreas Progerbul, is experienced in corporate sustainability, sustainable investments, impact investing, environmental management, and international cooperation. Since 1991, he has been assigned as a leading figure of various sustainability, environment, and nature programs, including four long-term long -term advisor positions abroad in Bolivia, Malawi, Madagascar, and Zambia, but also on short-term missions in more than 25 countries. Now, before I leave the floor to James, I will present the Technology Needs Assessment Project to give you a little bit of an overview of what we are doing. So the TNA project is implemented by the UN Environment Programme and the UNFDTO Partnership on behalf of the Global Environment Facility. And TNAs, what are they? They are a set of country-driven activities where we help developing countries assess their technology needs for climate change adaptation, but also mitigation. It is a three-year process during which in-country teams of consultants work on the identification, prioritization, and diffusion of climate technologies. Here on the slide, you can see three key steps of the TNA process. So firstly, the country team of consultants will identify and prioritize mitigation and adaptation 
technologies for selected sectors. And these sectors are usually the one present in their nationally determined contribution, their NDC. As a second step, they will analyze and address the barriers hindering the deployment and diffusion of the technologies that they prioritize. And uh, they determined what an enabling framework uh, they can create for the successful deployment of these technologies. So when we talk about barriers uh, that can hinder the deployment of technologies, we talk, for example, uh, about a lack of human skills or insufficient technical knowledge or also the need for raising awareness about the benefits of a technology. Finally, as a third step, Based on the inputs that they obtained from the two previous steps, the country teams will develop a TAP, a technology action plan, with actions presented in terms of project ideas. Um, countries can then take these project ideas forward for the proposal development for its actual implementation. So here we understand that with the TNAs, country can pursue both the targets they agreed under the Paris Agreement but also their National Sustainable Development Goals, their SDGs. So this TNA project started in 2009, and since then, close to 100 developing countries have joined the project. They are SIDS, uh, small islands and developing states, but also LDCs, least developed countries, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Africa and also in Asia Pacific. And uh, last year, in October 2020, we entered the fourth round of TNAs, where we have 17 new countries, mainly LDCs and SIDS, uh, which have joined the project. And you can see them listed here. Now, a little bit of background. Um, when we combine the information from the reports that are being, that are being developed by TNA countries, um, since the start of the project 2009 until now, we can see a clear pattern in the prioritization of key adaptation and mitigation sectors. So as you can see here on the graph, 95% of countries um, select the energy sector as the key sector for decreasing their level of CO2 emissions. And in this sector, uh, the technologies that countries want to focus on and develop are mainly solar panels, solar PVs, but also hydropower or the development of energy efficient infrastructures with, for example, the uptake of energy efficient lightning system, LED, in buildings. Uh, then we can see then transport and waste management follow the energy sector as key priority sector. On the adaptation side, uh, countries in the three regions are characterized by rapid economic and demographic growth, which trigger urbanization and changes in consumption. So this puts pressure on the region's agricultural and water sectors that are also at the same time highly impacted by climate change. 97% of TNA countries, here you can see, prioritize this water sector. Um, to adapt to climate change negative impacts, but also 90, uh, sorry, 86% prioritize the agriculture sector. Examples of technologies um, are resilient crops, uh, such as, for example, salt, pests, and drought tolerant crop varieties, but also the deployment of drip irrigation systems, precision farming, and rainwater harvesting. So before my colleague James elaborates a bit more on the linkages between DNAs and SHGs, I will give you a short summary of what we talk about when we talk about sustainable development goals. Well, world leaders agreed upon the SDGs in 2015 during a United Nations summit, and they developed the SDGs with the goal to create a better and fairer world by 2030. Uh, with the goal to end poverty and inequality and to address climate change. So they have defined 17 SDGs, which you can see here on the right, uh, that are agreed on and applicable to all countries. They have also set targets and indicators to measure and track the progress towards implementation of these uh, SDGs worldwide. And the goal here really is to, um, to, 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 to make people understand and get attention uh, on these important goals that are the 17 
Development Goals. So the 2020s have been called the Decade of Action. And here with our TNA projects, uh, we can we can say that we are really supporting the SDGs uh, 6, 7, 9, but also 15, uh, as these specific sectors are highly prioritized by countries undertaking TNAs and that we're pushing for technologies, uh, climate technologies in these sectors to be implemented on the ground. And it is clear as well that the technology agenda directly responds to goal 13, which aims to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. So now I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, James. But before that, um, I would like you to know that if you have any question about the TNA project, feel free to contact uh, Sarah, La Camelta Sotrero who is a TNA project manager globally, uh, or myself, and you can also visit our website here. Thanks a lot, and uh, I will give the floor to you, James. Hi, thank you, Leah. So, yeah, I, I basically, I just have uh, five slides, and I'm going to try and summarize the key points uh, that we put in the final section of the briefing, which, which um, we published recently. <laughs> on linking the TNAs and the SDGs. And then, you know, we, we added this sort of framing about green growth, which is a sort of political term, but we can try and unpack that a little bit. Um, so what I want to do really is step back a bit and try to understand the TNA process in the bigger picture and question, you know, how it relates to other national development processes and ultimately to investment in specific projects. Um, and, and, you know, and these projects, we could say, are in support of green growth, if we use that, that term. Um, the photo here is of the uh, Ramagana on-grid PV project in Rwanda, which uh, was the largest um, such project in East Africa when it was completed in 2014. It's a 8.5 megawatt project, which may, may seem relatively small now, but at the time it was the biggest of its, of its kind. Uh, and it wasn't the result of a TNA process, but it could have been. And that was that was kind of my my point uh, that I wanted to sort of make there. Uh, and and if you're interested in 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 knowing more about that particular project, um, we actually did some research and wrote a paper about it, uh, detailing the story from conception, from idea through to completion, and sort of documenting the journey of how everyone was involved and uh, the process of of getting that project online. Um, so feel free to get in touch. So we heard from Lair about the, the steps in the TNA process, um, and which leads us to a set of, of outputs. And you know, these outputs are stakeholder driven and, and, and inclusive. Um, but, but once the, the action plans, the, the, the technology action plans, the TAPs, once they're complete, you know, what happens? What happens next? And I think that is really the key question. Um, uh, and I would argue that ultimately we want the TAPs to stimulate or enable the production of sort of pre-feasibility project ideas and that they could be both on the mitigation side or the adaptation side. And that's really how we can push along, uh, the, the, the develop and push along the, the pipeline of project ideas. Because ultimately it's, it's investment that drives or enables technology transfer or upgrading um, uh, and ultimately the impact that we, that we want to see. And then, then you, by extension, you could say this contributes to green growth. Um, um, but also, you know, investors, both public and private, increasingly need to see the quantifiable um, SDG benefits or co-benefits of specific project ideas. So beyond just the narrow uh, return on investment, the financial return on investment, or even the, the narrow focus on climate impacts, uh, which normally are, are measured in, in, in tons of carbon em, uh, emission reductions. Uh, so, so what else can we achieve? Um, and then, you know, understanding these co-benefits is in packaging that up is what is commonly referred to as ESG investment. So that's environmental, social, uh, and corporate governance. And, and I think Andreas will, will talk in more detail about this. Um, but really, these are the key factors in measuring the sustainability and impact of, a, of an investment, uh, whether it's an investment in a specific project or a company. Um, operating in, in, in the TNA countries. Um, so, you know, in order to develop project ideas in the TAPs that can offer these ESG impacts, it's really useful to include 
the SDG indicators and co-benefits into the TNA multi-criteria assessment. So that's one concrete sort of recommendation for countries currently involved or, or the, the future round of countries. So in practice, how, how do we better integrate SDGs and TNAs? And I'm, I'm thinking here about, you know, the day-to-day -day reality for, for the project coordinators in the countries. Um, and I think, you know, the first thing, it, it's important to say that in reality, of course, the TNA process is, is, is relatively small, if you like, or and it's certainly one of many uh, related nationally driven processes that, that support the NDCs or, or SDG priorities. So, you know, we need to be realistic about that uh, and, and involve the right people from the start. Um, and in some countries, uh, there are sort of SDG specific focal persons from different ministries um, who have different mandates. And, and in which case we need, they need to be closely involved in the TNA process from the beginning so that they can see the benefits of the TNA process in support of their objectives. So that we're not just seen as a climate change initiative, but one in which the, the, that other ministries and other stakeholders can can see uh, a benefit from from getting involved and ultimately an impact that supports their their agenda. Um, so, for example, um, right now we're working with the the government of Nigeria, the Ministry of um, Environment, on a proposal for the for the Green Climate Fund, the GCF. Now that project is aimed at expanding the market for clean cooking technologies um, in support of their NDC. So it's, it's, a, it's coming from the climate angle, and they've prioritized that, that sector and that technology, uh, that issue, if you like, of clean cooking. Um, but we've also made reference to many of the co-benefits beyond just the greenhouse gas emission reductions potential, um, uh, such as you know, improved uh, health that comes from reduced indoor air pollution, the food security, the gender dimension, education, biodiversity, there's a whole range of co-benefits. And so in, in doing so and in explicitly uh, valuing those co-benefits, we can tick many of the SDG boxes, if you like, um, uh, to secure the political support and buy-in that we need from other ministries and other stakeholders beyond just the climate change community. And I think that's, that's really the, what I wanted to say on that point. I, this slide, I just wanted to to make a, um, a few, say a few words about large infrastructure projects because they are often a common output or conclusion of the TNA. That often this is what countries end up sort of prioritizing, um, and most such big projects require l a larger share of public financing, um, but they also offer many co-benefits you know, in terms of uh, improved public health for example, in public transport or, or urban planning. So if we can quantify and include these co-benefits in the TNA process, it can support the case for scaled up public investment um, in, in these kind of projects um, and so that we explicitly value both the climate and the SDG targets or priorities. So uh, and I think nowadays, of course, it's all about pandemic proofing and, and the sort of response to COVID and, and a lot of, a lot of um, additional boxes that we can tick, tick there. And I think, uh, you know, the whole build back better agenda, which, again, a bit like green growth is political rhetoric. But if we how do we operationalize that? How do we unpack that? Um, I think, um, you know, we can also offer a lot of climate and, and, and sustainable development um, co-benefits. Uh, and offer a renewed political mandate to work with in developing countries and, and harmonizing the analysis from policy planning and project development to explicitly include the, the, uh, the, the build back better agenda, if you like. Uh, in many cases, especially on the climate change mitigation side, this also means linking our technology focused analysis to SDG specific activities um, and sources of multilateral investment. So, you know, and, and that would be to incentivize or de-risk the private sector investment in specific projects. And that's what we really need to, to unlock. Uh, and that leads to, the, to this final slide. Um, um, and here I just wanted to make a few points. Uh, for example, you know, public, publicly funded financing, uh, for example, through the, the GCF, which offers a mix of grants or concessional debt financing. Um, you know, this is crucial for lower income countries where 
you know, there are a lot of uh, risks to investment that limit the scope or scale of, of otherwise commercial projects, um, even for, for technologies that, that would easily secure private equity or debt financing in developed countries or, or large emerging countries. The risks uh, of, of equivalent projects are just higher in developing countries, broadly speaking. So, so here, you know, there's a, there's a key role for the regional development banks, the Inter uh, the African Development Bank, Asia Development Bank, etc., who can finance uh, pre-feasibility or full feasibility studies and help develop and de-risk investment opportunities that could result from the from the TNA tap process, and then then we use that to leverage debt financing or equity investment from ESG funds especially those that, that, that specialize in developing countries um, and have you know, different degrees of, of risk appetite. Uh, and, and, and this is doing so is, is, is called sort of you know, blended finance. You know, in other words, how do we use development funds to, to mobilize private capital? Uh, and ultimately, that is what we need to do. We need to unlock that private capital if countries are going to secure investments on a scale that is required to achieve their NDC targets, because I think the scale is often misunderstood. You know, it's, 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 there's a huge gap between the needs and the, 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 the reality of financing. So um, that was a very brief run through of the, of the key links between the TNAs, SDGs and, and the green growth agenda, if you like. Um, I hope that was clear. Um, we, we can have a, a Q&A session later on. Um, but right now, I will pass over to our colleague, Christopher Manda, who's the TNA coordinator in Malawi. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure uh, to, to be part of uh, this webinar and uh, to share um, Malawi's perspectives on the link between the TNA activities and the SDGs and our national um, uh, targets. So within this presentation, uh, I will just share how um, the SDGs uh, link to uh, the Malawi vision and development uh, agenda. Uh, I'll just give a glimpse uh, of uh, the prioritized uh, climate technologies, uh, which the country prioritized. Then I'll, I'll talk about um, what's the link between uh, our TNA activities and the SDGs. And lastly, I'll just give um, some examples uh, on the specific SDG. TG targets, which are linked to uh, the, the climate technologies which were prioritized. Uh, in 2015, uh, the government of Malawi ratified the and, and adopted the agenda 2030 uh, in 2015 September. And this has been domesticated uh, through its alignment to the Malawi uh, Growth and Development Strategy 3, and also the recently uh, approved and launched Malawi Vision 2063. Uh, in the in the next slide, I'll just give a synopsis uh, of the, of these two important documents for the country, uh, which um, have highlighted uh, climate technologies as a vehicle uh, to achieve uh, the country's Malawi Vision. Beginning with the vision, uh, it has three pillars. Uh, we have agriculture productivity and commercialization pillar. We also have the industrialization pillar, and lastly, the urbanization pillar. But I'll focus uh, on these two uh, pillars, uh, which uh, presents uh, and highlights uh, uh, a couple of technologies uh, which are key uh, in achieving uh, these pillars. So for uh, the agriculture productivity pillar, it highlights that Climate smart uh, and resilient agriculture is key uh, to, to achieve the country's uh, productivity. It also cites that there is need uh, for integrated agriculture, which encompasses uh, the different aspects uh, of agriculture uh, coming together just to ensure that the, the nation is resilient. Um, it also stresses um, the need for effective extension services. And lastly, uh, it promotes an ecosystem approach uh, between the uh, the three pillars uh, of, of of the vision, uh, the second pillar uh, on industri industrialization it highlights uh, uh, the need for sustainable and renewable energy uh, as key uh, to to the achievement uh, 
of, of the country's vision uh, in trying to industrialize. The, the other document which is key uh, for the development agenda is the uh, the median uh, the medium term strategy, the Malay Growth and Development Strategy Three. Uh, this document prioritizes uh, climate change management uh, as part of, of the key priority area uh, on agriculture, uh, water development, and, and climate change. Uh, in relation to um, uh, the, the prioritized list of uh, of technologies uh, for the country, uh, we had uh, four sectors, and uh, I'll just present a glimpse of, of of some of the technologies which were prioritized by the country. Uh, so we have under agriculture, uh, we have land landscape restoration for improvement. So we have uh, integrated crop, uh, livestock, and aquaculture, which is similar to uh, what I presented earlier on as the key prerequisites to achieve agriculture productivity. Um, under the water sector, we have rainwater harvesting. We have integrated river basin management. Um, under energy uh, sector, we have uh, LOPG for cooking. Uh, we also have uh, solar PV and improved charcoal uh, production kins. Uh, for the forest sector, we have similarly uh, to, to, to the agriculture sector, we have forest landscape restoration because these two sectors are, are interconnected. We have also farmer uh, managed natural regeneration. Uh, and lastly, uh, we have the biochar uh, production from forest waste. Just to highlight that uh, if, if, if you observe from, from, from our prioritized list, uh, there is a direct link uh, to uh, the SDG number 13. Uh, which uh, urges uh, the country to, to urgently uh, take action to, to combat uh, climate change. So there's a direct link to, 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 to that SDG. For the four sectors which, uh, which were prioritized, um, uh, the scope for the prioritization mainly looked at, uh, for example, for the adaptation uh, sectors, where those sectors would, would reduce vulnerability and also increase uh, resilient building. That's when uh, the country opted for the agriculture and water sector. And this, you'd also see that uh, there's also uh, links to um, the SDG 1, uh, SDG 2, and um, SDG 6. And for the mitigation sector, um, uh, the prioritization mainly focused on those sectors which have the, uh, the greatest contribution uh, to, to mitigate uh, to, to greenhouse gases. So we had the energy and forest sectors, which are also uh, directly linked to uh, SDG number seven and also number 15. In the next slide, I'll just be discussing in terms of uh, some of the um, specific uh, or example of SDG targets, which uh, our, uh, our prioritized uh, uh, technologies uh, are aligned to or are talking to. Uh, so, for, for example, for the uh, uh, adaptation uh, sectors, the agriculture and water sectors, we have a direct link to, uh, to the SDG target 1.5, which is on building the resilience uh, of the poor and those uh, in vulnerable situations. Uh, there's also uh, a link to SDG 2 uh, target uh, 2.4, uh, which is related to sustainable food production systems and resilient uh, agriculture. And this is also, if you have observed from uh, our vision, uh, whereby it's, it's promoting an integrated um, uh, food production system. There's also a direct link uh, to uh, SDG 6, uh, target 6.5 on integrated water resources management. I think from, 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 from our prioritized uh, technologies, you have um, integrated river basin management, which is also in line uh, with, with, with uh, that particular SDG target 6.5. Uh, as it was indicated uh, from the previous presenters, uh, the process uh, involved a lot of stakeholders and um, uh, the inclusion of gender has been part of, of the process. So we feel uh, we are also contributing uh, to SDG 5, uh, target 5.5, uh, which is on ensuring that there is a for women's and effective participation, and also their equal opportunities uh, for both gender. 
So we feel the process itself has been encompassing uh, and is also aligned to uh, SDG 5. Uh, in the next slide, I also uh, give specific examples to the, the mitigation sectors, uh, which are energy and forest. Uh, we feel um, our prioritized technologies are also aligned to uh, the SDG 7, uh, target 7.1, which is on universal access uh, to affordable, or reliable, and modern energy services. The other uh, uh, target which uh, we feel uh, as a country, uh, our, our technologies are aligned to is on 7.2, which is on increasing the share of renewable energy in the global mix. And lastly, on energy, we have on improved uh, in energy efficiency. Uh, if, if you refer back to uh, our technologies, uh, we had one on uh, improved charcoal production kings. Uh, we do understand as a country that we have challenges uh, in the energy sector uh, because of uh, our low generation uh, capacity. And uh, despite um, their efforts to increase the share of renewable energy, in, in, the, in the country's mix, uh, we still understand that uh, the majority of the population is still dependent on biomass. So um, the country also prioritized this, uh, uh, the improved charcoal production kits, so that in the, in the medium term, we would also improve our energy efficiency uh, for the country. And, and lastly, um, and in, with regards to forestry, uh, we feel, um, uh, our, our climate technologies are aligned to SDG uh, 15, and in particular, uh, target uh, 15.1 uh, on conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of terrestrial uh, and freshwater ecosystems, uh, which includes also uh, the forest uh, resources. Uh, we also have SDG 15 target uh, 15.2 on sustainable um, management of all types of forest. Uh, halting deforestation and other degraded uh, forest. And lastly, as I highlighted in, in my previous slide, um, uh, we feel the process itself has been encompassing uh, uh, to include uh, the voice of women and other gender and other uh, vulnerable groups. I will now uh, give the floor uh, to uh, Deepika. Hello, Vinaka, everyone. I'm Deepika from Fiji. And today I'll be presenting on achieving the sustainable development. The contents of my presentation are, um, are divided into a three. The first being um, an overview of key national policies. Uh, the second component looks at SDGs addressed by the Fijian Kenny. And the third component looks at the draft Climate Change Bill 2020, which we consider as the game changer in Fiji. Or to um, give an overview of Fiji's five-year and 20-year national development plan. Um, this is the national guiding doc document for all national and sectoral uh, uh, planning and uh, development planning. Um, the NDP itself is a response to SDG 12 and it consists of a two-pronged approach. Firstly, um, inclusive socioeconomic development that would ensure that no one is left behind regardless of a national uh, geographical location, gender, ethnicity, um, physical and intellectual capability, and social, uh, sh social and economic status. Basically, the, uh, this approach would ensure that um, inclusivity is at the center of growth and development uh, to improve social well-being of all Fijians. The second approach is informational, a transformational strategic thrust, which are considered game-changing and forward-looking policies, um, policy shifts to expand our development frontier in transforming Fiji. And this would look at nurturing uh, emerging and growing sectors, um, connectivity, uh, increasing the connectivity of Fiji to the world, and 
introducing and embracing new technologies and um, developing human capital for an accelerated green growth um, to implement the uh, national development plan. The beauty about uh, the Fiji and NDP is that it is measured using key performance indicators derived from um, sustainable development goals. And you will see a snapshot of this in the next slide. The overall goal is to um, uh, increase efforts to become a resilient, decarbonized Fiji while supporting the achievement of Fiji's. As I have mentioned earlier, the, the second um, key policy that I ought to discuss um, in, in my presentation is the Republic of Fiji National Climate Change Policy 2018-2020. Fiji, um, in its efforts to implement the NDC, uh, uh, NDC targets developed an NDC implementation roadmap in 2017 after submitting the um, INDC. And this implementation roadmap looks to provide a temporal pathway for implementation of mitigation actions. These actions are short, medium, and long term, and they are needed to achieve um, the NDC targets. These 12 actions are actually addressing several um, SDGs, as you can see um, in the table below. Looking at Fiji's adaptation priorities, as per the National Adaptation Plan, um, the Fijian government has identified Now, diving deep into the Fijian TNA, um, uh, the sectors um, diving deep into how um, um, Fiji will achieve uh, diving deep into which SDGs Fiji will achieve through implementing technologies in the rural electrification side. As you have seen um, in my previous um, slides, um, rural electrification is in fact a national development target. It is also um, uh, an SDG target and SDG um, sp specifically SDG 7 looking at ensuring that there is access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. Um, Fiji, the Fijian government actually um, uh, has several initiatives to address rural electrification, this includes the Rural Electrification uh, Program, Fiji Rural Electrification Program, as well as the Fiji, um, uh, uh, Fiji Rural Electrification Fund, which looks at actually um, uh, electrifying rural communities through the setup of solar home systems or small microgrids. For technologies um, under the dom domestic maritime shipping, Fiji, as you all may know, is an island nation with about 300, and 300 or more islands um, scattered around its economic exclusive economic zone. And one of our primary means of um, uh, tra modes of traveling is uh, shipping. And to ensure that there is connectivity amongst all Fijians, um, we, we have prioritized the domestic shipping industry um, uh, under the Technology Needs Assessment Project. Um, the domestic shipping industry uh, has also um, got a very uh, ambitious target of reducing 45% emission, uh, emission reductions, achieving 45% emission reductions from uh, by uh, at a more regional level. So the key um, um, 
the key SDGs that would be addressed through the implementation of technologies under this sector would be SDG 7, uh, particularly as, as indicated at uh, target 7.12, which is increasing the population's reliance on clean fuels and technology, and 7.2.2, 7.2.1, which involves um, increasing the total uh, renewable energy share and the total energy consumption. For technologies um, to address nation climate change adaptation in Fiji, um, the sector that uh, that was um, selected or prioritized uh, in the TNE project was the agriculture sector. The agriculture has proven to be um, an important sector, especially in times where our tourism industry has been heavily impacted by COVID-19. So through um, um, the agriculture uh, sector, um, technologies include um, improved uh, nutrient management, uh, improved crop varieties, and agroforestry. And through these technologies, we aim to achieve um, zero hunger, ensure that the SDG 7 is met, ensuring healthy lives and uh, promote well-being of at all ages. Um, through the implementation of agroforestry, there will be also a um, um, uh, contribution to SDG 15 on life on land, especially with increasing carbon sinks on land. Looking at the coastal zones, um, technologies identified for coastal zones include mangrove plantation, um, um, sea walls and um, construction of steel walls and groins, as well as flood hazard mapping. So because Fiji is going heavy on nature-based solution, there is an opportunity um, for Fiji to um, enhance um, um, traditional knowledge and address SDG 7. Um, similarly, um, there is a lot of contribution towards SDG um, 11, which is on sustainable cities and, uh, and communities. And as Fiji's, most of Fiji's communities are based on uh, in coastal regions, this would significantly contribute to achieving SDG 11. Um, the adoption of uh, technologies under the coastal zones uh, sector will also contribute heavily to SDG 14, life below, below sea, and will ensure that contribute towards the sustainable supply of fish and other forest, I mean, uh, other sea products for consumption. Moving on to the draft climate change bill 2020. So the draft climate change bill 2020 is a remarkable document, um, very comprehensive, um, and it will um, it it basically gives um, gives while the climate change bill. Um, is a leading example of uh, of any initial climate change le legislation. It also reflects Fiji's vulnerability as an island nation to climate change. Um, the climate change bill seeks to legalize um, the vision of the national climate change policy, which is the well-being of current and future generations is supported and protected by a socially inclusive, equitable, and environmentally sustainable net zero emissions economy. And the health, diversity, and productivity of environment is protected and enhanced for benefit for future generations. So basically, the climate change bill would look to secure the lives of our future generations. Um, it provides a very comprehensive framework to Fiji's response to climate change. Um, uh, and the bill 
can be built on over time and will be supported and defined by regulations, um, guidelines, reporting, and review of cycles. So, so basically, um, 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 the um, the climate change give legalizes some of our uh, national reporting processes as well as guidelines for the, uh, guidelines and reporting uh, um, uh, reporting um, structures for national communications and other GHG inventories and so on um, and, and other MRV processes. Uh, the draft bill also looks to enhance cross-government uh, uh, efforts to manage climate risk. So it increases a lot of um, collaboration. It defines, it clearly defines roles in governance arrangements in the delivery of uh, Fiji's climate change objectives and to increase national resilience. So it, it basically outlines a very clear instit uh, institutional structure in the delivering um, climate adaptation mitigation um, actions on ground. And um, the bill looks at strengthening a, col a strategic collaboration and data sharing between ministries. So this would basically um, increase the information required to anticipate and manage climate risk. So for us, um, the, um, the enaction of this bill is very important and we 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 are looking forward to thank you um now i'd like to give um um the floor over to our next speaker i will uh, continue from where uh, we left in uh, fiji um, and talk about uh, the private sector and investments uh, as uh, James was uh, alluding to, uh, the amount of uh, resources that is uh, necessary to make a green transition is uh, tremendous and therefore the private sector has a big role to fill in terms of uh, um, making uh, some of these uh, things happening uh, in, the, uh, in the developing countries. So if I... Uh, just talk a little bit about uh, Neros. Neros is a consulting company and uh, we are basically uh, calling ourselves uh, next generation consulting because we want to uh, contribute to a better and more equal and stable world in line with the STGs and therefore we have also adopted the STGs as a, as a company. Uh, Neros is a uh, a, a, a global uh, consulting engineering company and we are working in uh, more than 30 countries and we have uh, about 7,000 ongoing projects um, for the time being. Neuros is uh, working across all the major sectors. Uh, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about agriculture, and water, uh, water utilities. Um, one of the things that uh, characterize NEROS is that we are actually also working interdisciplinary or cross-sectorial with our assignments uh, so that we can um, make the solutions that clients need, uh, irrespectively of, of the divisions and the silos that we are working in also. Uh, Neros has uh, adopted the STGs and that means that we have uh, actually prepared some tools that uh, can help uh, our clients um, develop uh, projects which can uh, contribute to the STGs. Also we can go out in a, a company and uh, help them to identify where uh, they are actually making contributions to, to the SDGs uh, in their line of business. Um, basically, we have made several uh, different tools that is um, playing together with the SDGs and uh, these four are mentioned here. I think the most important one is uh, the SDG capture, which is exactly the tool that helps um, 
projects and companies to identify their contribution to, to the SDGs. Um, NIROS has also uh, worked uh, quite a lot with uh, uh, climate change and carbon footprint and uh, we have been invited by the Danish Business Authority to make a tool uh, called the Climate Compass which also helps uh, companies uh, to actually um, assess their their uh, carbon footprint uh, in their activities. Some of these tools are available uh, on the internet, so you can just uh, Google them and find them. Now, uh, uh, talking about the private sector, uh, there's a lot of um, services that uh, needs to be carried out uh, in order to go through to, uh, a green transition. And I mentioned some of them here, uh, which are typical services that also uh, Nero's Consulting is, is, is providing. Um, they uh, deal with the investment uh, process because in many cases you need to map out or uh, assess the feasibility of a certain investment or you need to do a due diligence of a certain investment before you can actually raise the funds and, and get the, the funding uh, going. Um, and for this, uh, typically consulting engineering companies will work with the private sector to put in place the reports and the uh, surveys that is necessary, including, of course, uh, environmental impact assessments or environmental social impact assessments, but also a lot of other analysis uh, are becoming uh, crucial in terms of assessing uh, an investment in the uh, in the making. Um, if we look at the investment process uh, in the private sector. Uh, you have a, a series of events uh, where you start uh, probably with a with a concept note, and then you develop your a project proposal, and you search for finance, and then if you get finance, you can proceed to implementation, and finally you can evaluate your uh, project and sell shares uh, for those who are participating in the um, in the project. Now, uh, these different stages uh, actually um, involves um, a, a different uh, reporting, uh, screening and due diligence, feasibility study, um, and all these are actually um, stages which needs to be uh, completed uh, before you can actually proceed with your investment. Now coming uh, to uh, the t today's topic uh, on technology needs assessment, then uh, we have heard from the, the presentations from Malawi, but also from Fiji, that uh, yes, it all starts with the development plans and the sector plans, and then uh, the, the national uh, mitigation plans and the adaptation plans and the NDCs um, and investments has to be aligned with these other um, elements so that uh, it can uh, contribute to the overall framework of, of the country development uh, plans. And that's why uh, the TNA process uh, and especially the um, barrier analysis uh, on an enabling framework, the BAF uh, part of the TNA assessment uh, is very crucial uh, in, in this regard, especially because uh, many investors will need, uh, for instance, uh, to have a, a proper um, legal framework for power purchase agreement in the case of offshore wind or uh, photovoltaic uh, solar panels, uh, you need to have the framework in place for the PPAs in order to 
uh, roll out investments. Um, uh, the picture here is from a, uh, an investment in in Kenya, uh, the very big uh, Lake Turkana wind power um, project, uh, which the Danish um, agency for um, uh, development uh, investment investing the ifu has um, has uh, invested together with a lot of other uh, dfis development finance institutions um, but this investment only came about because uh, the framework for the power purchase agreement was in place there can also be other um, other uh, regulatory and uh, uh, legal aspects that needs to be in place, especially also the local spatial planning and uh, um, in case of, of a major infrastructure, this has to be aligned with, with the, the local uh, planning. So altogether, um, the rollout of, of uh, investments uh, really depends on uh, that these barriers can be overcome and uh, that um, that the risks are taken out of the investments projects uh, so that uh, investors can rest assured that, that that they will get the return that they that they uh, expect um, James also alluded to the more recent uh, aspects of ESG investing and here we can see also that the that the development finance institutions like IFO, the Danish um, uh, Investment Fund for Developing Countries, has um, moved towards more impact-oriented investments. And for instance, in the case of Lake Turkana, uh, there was a side effect of opening up this area for uh, by making roads up to the area uh, that. Uh, the fisheries in Lake Turkana actually all of a sudden were able to um, market their fish uh, in far away um, urban areas that was not uh, accessible prior to the, the wind turbine project. So that's an example uh, of uh, where some of these investments actually open up um, new uh, economic areas uh, where they are placed. I think uh, that's all I have uh, uh, on the private investment uh, side of things. Um, but uh, definitely these uh, investments are going to be very important in, in terms of scaling uh, the um, climate change uh, and uh, green transition in all the countries that uh, that is working on that for the time being. So with that, I hand back to Leah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Um, so I would like to move forward with the Q&A session, if, if this is... Yes. Great. Thanks a lot. So we have uh, received some interesting questions from the from the audience, um, and I have uh, maybe I can suggest that we will put our cameras, all panelists. Great, great to see your faces. <laughs> Perfect. Everyone is on board. So. We had a question for you, James. Um, so the, the 2020s, they have been called the decade of action. And in that sense, um, one of, uh, one of the, the, the member of the audience was interested in knowing what is one key recommendation you could provide to TNA coordinators or co coordinators of uh, similar national climate processes uh, to move from activity planning to actual implementation of projects and climate technologies on the ground. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Um, I think it's a it's a good question. Um, I think the first thing I would would uh, comment is, is, is the word implementation. I think is a very kind of UN or government 
level word. It's a word that we use within the TNA project, you know. But but really, what does it mean to implement? I mean, that that's what I uh, would ask as the first thing. And to my mind, as as we discussed in in the presentations, it's really about this pipeline of investment uh, projects. And only once you go from you know, plans through to financial closure of a specific investment opportunity, then you can say you've implemented a TNA or a technology action plan. That that I would I would encourage us to kind of visualize the connections between this high level uh, government level work uh, and you know <clears throat> physical infrastructure or project investment on the ground because there is a connection or, or there can be a connection, and we really need to sort of visualize. Uh, the 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 journey between uh, you know from from plans to implementation if you like uh, so my one recommendation I think would be to um, invite potential project developers to uh, articulate the technology action plans so because by by the time you get to that stage you already know what the prior the government has prioritized its technologies you know through the stakeholder process. They've even discussed what the barriers and potential measures are to overcome those barriers. Um, but then it's about articulating project ideas. And, and, and why not involve project developers at that stage? Because if we don't, then we just have to we put those plans up online or you distribute them and you hope that somebody picks them up and says, oh, this is interesting opportunity. Um, but it, but it, I think it's more likely to lead to something if we actually reach out and invite project developers, and they could be local, regional, uh, international, um, and actually help articulate the, the TAPs. And I, I don't think we've done that enough, and I think it's a missed opportunity. So so for Christopher and Dipitika and, and others who are, who are running the TNAs, that could be one concrete uh, recommendation from, from my side. Thanks. Thanks a lot, James. Um, I have a, a question for Andreas uh, from NIHAS to understand how NIHAS screens project concept note. We can see in the in, in your last slide that, that you mentioned uh, screening of project concept note. Um, and what are the what are the key criteria that are used to, to select this project concept note and move forwards uh, into the feasibility studies? So here again, focus on the actual implementation of the uh, mm. project. Yeah, well, uh, of course, we are uh, hired as uh, as consult uh, consulting engineer uh, to do a specific job on a on a on a particular um, a concept note, for instance, um, and. Uh, if we are hired to do that, then we would, of course, uh, try to make as much as possible uh, clear that uh, this this uh, concept note should actually also contribute to the SDGs. And uh, uh, if it's not clearly spelled out, then uh, we would, uh, together with the client, uh, develop these aspects further. And we have seen from uh, various projects that it actually brings more value to the project if we uh, take an exercise and use the tool we call SDG Capture and uh, and actually identify what ki kind of contributions do we have in this project uh, to the SDGs. And maybe we have overlooked something and maybe uh, there are something that should be further elaborated to make this uh, investment opportunity even more attractive. Um, and in terms of investments, you always look for the uh, return on investment, uh, um, whether it's 10% uh, or 12% or, 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 or the like. But also you can add value by, um, by adding uh, uh, benefits that will or impacts that will come out of the project, uh, and it, this we see increasingly that um, Danish pension funds are actually interested in this when they go for uh, private equity investments. That, that that they actually get investments that are also ESG investments or impact investments that has these uh, additional uh, impacts. Thank you. Um, one other question for you, Andreas. Um, does NIHAS has 
activities in the Pacific Islands? Um, from time to time, yes, we do have, uh, but um, I, I'm not sure if we have in this very moment. Uh, I think we had some uh, gender-oriented uh, work. Uh, some of our social eco econ economists uh, were doing uh, in Fiji, actually. So, um, so it's not that we are not working there. It's just that it depends on the assignments that we win, so to speak. Uh, if we are uh, uh, there, we don't have an office in in um, in Fiji, but uh, we have uh, offices uh, elsewhere in the Pacific, including Australia. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I have a question for Christopher. Christopher, um, what strategy will you use to move? from project idea or the development of your project uh, concept notes into the actual development of, uh, of the climate technologies that you prioritize with TNA process. So is it through project proposal development or through public-private partnerships or other kind of means? Can you elaborate a little bit on this uh, actual implementation strategy? Um, thank you for, for, for the question. Um, let me just highlight, uh, I feel the, uh, the TNA process, uh, is very comprehensive and, um, uh, it includes, um, most of uh, all the stakeholders which, which, which are key, uh, during the, uh, the prioritization of, of the technologies. And I think the second step also highlights, um, and provides an enabling framework uh, for for, uh, for the barriers uh, to the to, to to the technologies. So, in terms of strategy, I think the process offers an opportunity uh, to 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 come up with uh, with with a, uh, a comprehensive and and bankable concept note. But I think that will also depend uh, where uh, you're, you're seeking the resources from, uh, whether um, it's a public entity, uh, whether it's could, that could be funded by government um, or uh, from other uh, development financial institutions or whether th these are also like mat matrilateral uh, organization, including the GF and the GCF. But uh, I think from uh, Andrea's presentation, uh, there's also an opportunity, I think, to, to, to involve uh, the private sector. So it can either be uh, through public private partnership or completely uh, uh, the, the, the private sector. So I think we have a couple of avenues uh, uh, which can, can, can be used uh, uh, to, uh, to implement uh, uh, the project uh, uh, concepts. Thank you. There was a question about the, the usefulness of teenage and Understanding, okay, countries are doing TNAs, they are implementing TNAs nationwide, but are they actually being implemented? And, uh, well, this is a really good question. And I would like to guide you, uh, for this through our TNA website where you can find a lot of brochures on the TNA success stories where we give an overview of, um, the, the, the climate technologies actually being implemented by countries. So, um, once countries have ended the TNA process, they develop TNA project concept notes, which are then used to apply for funding. And uh, countries, through project proposal, um, can get funding from diverse financing sources. They can be applying for the Green Climate Fund, a readiness proposal. It can also be to, through the adaptation. Uh, fund, but also through regional banks such as the African Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank, and um, as well through the CTCN Climate Technology Center Network. And here we have an example. Uh, I, I can illustrate with an example from Armenia, uh, which is a country who conducted uh, TNA uh, not so long ago and had a focus on energy efficiency in buildings. So they wanted to improve their energy efficiency through retrofits of their buildings. So they applied for a green climate fund 
um, grant and uh, they managed to get a grant and associated this with co-financing from other sources and managed to uh, to have a project value of uh, uh, 30 million USD, so US dollars. And um, so the goal for uh, their project is to build a market for energy efficient buildings retrofits. And, and this was possible because they used the results of the TNA process and then applied for funding. And this is something that we are really pushing for um, uh, within the technology needs assessment project and really working with the country teams to, to, to move forward towards implementation. Um, but again, if you want to have a more comprehensive overview of this, you can uh, you can find all of the uh, uh, success stories on the on the TNA website. Um, yes, so I'm not sure we had more questions. Let me check again. We had a comment uh, from a PhD student. Uh, that would be interested in uh, participating to to webinars. Um, so Jane, feel free to 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 write us and uh, and uh, we'll see how we can collaborate uh, in the future on this. And uh, otherwise, maybe we could I could share my screen again. Just would like to thank everyone, uh, the, the the panelists for the interesting presentations, but also the audience for the interesting questions. Uh, and I would like to mention again that this webinar has been recorded, so you will find it online on the TNA website. And please also feel free to read uh, the publication that we have written at the UNFDT partnership on this topic of today's webinar that you will find on the website as well. So please feel free to contact us if you have any question. And uh, otherwise, uh, thanks a lot again, and I will wish you a good day or evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.